Hello, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome to Opera 101 with Cleveland Opera Theater. My name is Stephanie Ruzzo and I'm an education and outreach associate with Cleveland Opera Theater. Happy to be here today to chat with you for Opera 101, which is for all ages. So please, everybody, gather around and let's talk about some fun new thing about opera to help us all enjoy the music more, to, to kind of deepen our love of the art that we're already kind of familiar with. So uh, thank you for joining me today. We are, as you know, celebrating Rossini Month, and in honor of our special concert coming up this Saturday evening, um, we are celebrating the Barber of Seville this week. So we are going to be chatting Barber of Seville in, in a lead up to this amazing new bit of content you're going to be able to see Saturday evening. Um, and all of our info on that can be found on our website, clevelandoperatheater.org. So please do check that out for details and please join us Saturday night. So in honor of this moment, we are going to chat a little bit about the Barber of Seville this week. And um, I guess what I want to talk to you about is this really bizarre kind of blip on the historiographical radar of Barber of Seville. And today we know Rossini's Barber of Seville more than any other composers. That's pretty much the only one that we recognize, but it wasn't always the most famous and it wasn't always so celebrated. We didn't all, we meaning audiences, didn't always flock to it. So today, let's take a trip back to the very controversial premiere of the Barber of Seville back in 1816. And um, let's look at where the source material came from and why it was such an explosive deal when Rossini's opera first premiered. So this whole opera is based on a play by a French playwright from a mm, generation or two before named Pierre-Augustin Caron de Beaumarchais. And he was, like I said, a French playwright slash author in any number of other professions active right up until the French Revolution. So he actually even served Louis 15 and 16 um, as kind of an unofficial diplomat. And he was one of the courtiers. Uh, in that that upper echelon, but he had a marked sympathy for the lower classes, and he had a kind of an affinity for those who were not as fortunate. And he even dealt arms because of his politics. Uh, he dealt arms to American colonials during the American Revolution. So if that tells you um, anything about the kind of work he was doing and the beliefs he shared, he actually, because of his courtier status, though, despite his politics, was imprisoned during the French Revolution and only narrowly escaped with his life. So around, um, around the time of the American Revolution, we see two plays that he wrote, uh, kind of one play and its sequel, all revolving around the same characters. The first is The Barber of Seville. Uh, written in 1775, and its sequel, The Marriage of Figaro, in 1784. Those should both sound pretty familiar to us because of the Rossini and Mozart operas. But back before these were familiar conventional pieces of art that we all know, um, these were innovative for their focus on bourgeoisie characters rather than the aristocracy. So the fact that we have servants taking center stage was actually uh, quite, no, no pun intended, but very literally revolutionary. So he would take traditional French humor like that used by Moliere and Voltaire, and he applied this, this very incisive wit to lower class characters that we might not normally associate with that kind of wit. Um, and Figaro, the, the central barber of both stories, the title character, is actually a stock character, you know, the wily servant who outwits his master. Um, and the servant is clearly superior to the master, flipping societal relations on their head. Um, we, you know, we've seen this in Italy in the Commedia dell'arte. We've seen it in other, um, other comedic traditions like French farce. But... Um, these plays that Beaumarchais wrote are actually dangerous because 
he's cr- he's using it to criticize French aristocrats for taking advantage of servants and often women for their maltreatment of, say, the Countess in Marriage of Figaro and Rosina in Barber of Seville. And it actually made the aristocratic government look bad. But Subsequently, these became the rich source for opera, opera libretti. And, and Beaumarchais himself even wrote an opera libretto for Salieri. And the Figaro plays have been turned into multiple operas, like Megan mentioned on Monday. Um, you know, especially we see the Mozart, Marriage of Figaro, and, and as recently as John Carigliano in the 90s uh, with his Ghosts of Versailles. But the first superstar composer to make a mega hit out of the Figaro plays was an Italian opera composer named Giovanni Paisiello. And he was a Neapolitan born less than a decade after Beaumarchais. So they were contemporary. They're they're steeped in the same time period, the same global events. And Paisiello was the most famous opera composer of the late 18th century. He was mostly known for his comedies, but he also did some heroic operas, uh, what we might call semi-seria, half-serious stuff today. Um, And he was a global citizen. Paisiello was crazy cosmopolitan. He went to Russia as court composer for Empress Catherine II, stayed there for seven years in Russia composing. Um, And he saw the Beaumarchais plays at Catherine's court in 1780 and wrote Il Barriere di Sevilla for her. Um, But also towards the end of his tenure in Russia, he was kind of getting tired of it there, wanted to be back home in Naples. So he began campaigning for the position of compositore della musica dei drammi. So in other words, court opera composer for King Ferdinand in Naples. He wanted to get back home. And as part of this campaign, he actually sent several, what we might think of as audition scores, um, like, hey, look at this music I wrote. Why don't you hire me? I can write some more back home in Naples and you can be my patron. So he sent these audition pieces back to King Ferdinand. And on November 22nd, 1783, the court at Caserta uh, experienced Il Barbiere di Sevilla for the first time and, you know, were blown away. Paisiello obviously got the job. From that point, he was receiving commissions from all over Italy and even as far as London. But then in the uh, mid-1790s, he turned to religious music and accepted commissions more from monasteries for liturgical music. So he kind of left the opera stage of his life behind to focus more on this liturgical output. But throughout all of his career, he was known for simple melodies, strong rhythms, And a strong bass line, like that was his thing. If you could hear a strong bass line with some creative wind fills orchestrated on top, that was Paisiello's music. And he was beloved for this. Um, And he died on June 5th, 1816, as an absolute superstar. Keep that date in mind, June 5th. 1816, because Rossini's Barber of Seville premiered on February 20th, 1816. So there's some overlap. Paisiello was still alive when Rossini's premiere happened. And in fact, to, to placate him and his fans, Rossini had to issue a bunch of de- a bunch of defensive statements saying, I swear I'm not trying to outdo Paisiello. Um, This story just happens to be the one that got commissioned. We think it would be great. Um, I love Paisiello. I'm a super fan as well. I would never do anything to damage his reputation. And Rossini, uh, like Megan mentioned on Monday, had to title his work Alma Viva instead of Barber of Seville. So it actually premiered as Alma Viva, named for the Count rather than the Barber. Um, And another disaster befalling this was that the impresario who commissioned it, Duke Sforza Cesarini, died four days, count them four, before the premiere. So the biggest supporter of this work, who could have defended Rossini, and who could have been maybe a placating voice to the public, was out of the picture. Um, There were a whole bunch of stage accidents at the premiere. So not only was the music in trouble, the performers themselves 
were in trouble. And not just one, we're talking multiple accidents at this premiere. Um, the overture that we all know and love was not there. The Barber of Seville overture as we know it was not part of the premiere. And in fact, it was only shortly after the premiere appended. Um, it, it, Rossini borrowed it from one of his lesser known operas, Aureliano and Palmira. And that overture that we know and love was written for a completely different opera that did not survive and enter the canon. So Rossini thought, well, if the opera isn't going to survive, I guess the overture can if I put it into a different opera that I hope is going to be much, much, much more famous. Um, to add salt into all of these wounds, Rossini was conducting at the premiere, so Paisiello's fanboys came and heckled him the whole time. So keep in mind, patrons dead, accidents, disasters are all going on on the stage. It's absolutely crazy. And people are shouting at Rossini from the audience like, you hack, you have stolen Paisiello's work, you're, you're doing this to the detriment of his own memory. And this is my own personal theory here. I truly believe that uh, because Paisiello was known for such simplicity and clarity in his writing, what these fans were reacting against is this Rossini introduction of bel canto. All of the coloratura and fioritura that we talked about before, all of that beautiful ornamentation, if you listen to that and contrast it with the classical simplicity of Paisiello, We've got two very different aesthetics on hand. And so all of these Paisiello fans in the audience are thinking that Rossini is trying to come in like a bull in a china shop and uh, tear up all of the work that Paisiello did. Um, the premiere was actually so horrific. Rossini quit conducting slash directing the opera after that night. He only did one. Um, but we're so glad that he kept composing because now we have so many of his beautiful works in the canon and we get to hear this music that otherwise would have been consigned to history. So that's all I have for you guys today. Um, but please, if there's anything else that you would like to chat about, don't hesitate to pop it in the comments or to email me at sruzzo at clevelandoperatheater.org. That's S-R-U-O-Z-Z-O -Z -Z at clevelandoperatheater.org. And I'd love to chat with you then um, and give you any information you may hope for. In the meantime, please do keep up with us on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And we're going to keep putting content on all of those platforms that you can enjoy. Um, do check out our website, clevelandoperatheater.org, where you can be apprised of all of our virtual 2020 season because it is a big season. There is a lot happening, and I can't wait for you to see it all, starting on Saturday night with our latest concert, totally free to tune in. Um, get all the deets at clevelandoperatheater.org, and I can't wait to see you there. Thank you all. Bye.